Um, so welcome to uh, Compassionate Responses, utilizing calling in to address challenging comments. Uh, my name is Mac Kreit, M-A-C-C-R-I-T-E. I am uh, a teaching and learning specialist here at AU, and I use they, them pronouns. And then... Hi, my name is Shed, like the thing in your backyard. I go by she or they pronouns, and I'm also a teaching and learning specialist at the CTRL. And then uh, for those folks in person, we have a QR code here. If you want to access our slides, you can also go to that tiny URL link. Um, we have it at a few different points throughout the presentation um, in the event that you want to refer back to what we're um, sharing. Uh, we'll also share everything out that we have over um, email after the, the session. All right. So as always, we like to... Um, start with a bit of a warm up. Um, unfortunately, our poll everywhere is not working right now. Um, so we'd love to just kind of hear from folks or just think about what types of concerns are do you typically have when trying to address challenging? And these could be ignorant, offensive, just kind of off kilter um, comments that students might make. We have a few different options. Um, again, the poll everywhere just isn't quite working right now. And so apologies for that. Um, so feel free to just kind of think about which of these responses resonate with you. Um, if you're on Zoom, you can feel free to put one of those responses in the chat or share another thing um, that is not uh, listed on these uh, as one of these options. And we'll give folks just a little bit to think about that. Um, and then in terms of... able to hide that. So on Zoom, some folks are saying that they're worried about doing or saying something that might make the situation worse. And then anybody in the room want to share any concerns? It's, it's all right if you don't want to. That's totally fair. Yeah. So we had Sahil, uh, for those of you online, uh, Sahil mentioning that also it could be disconcerting to try to say to say or do something that could make the situation worse. And similarly, you could potentially have uh, a situation where if you don't say anything, that could also make the situation worse. So trying to think about that. All right. Um, so then uh, we have, so that's just kind of like a, something to get you on uh, kind of ready to go for the session today. Um, as always, we typically have guidelines for participation for folks. Um, this is a good thing that you can actually do in your own courses, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, if you've been in any of our sessions today, I think each of our sessions has both the same guidelines and for participation, but also talks about the value of having those in your own courses. Um, so throughout the session, we'll ask that you just make yourself comfortable, feel free to get up, move around, um, whatever you need to do in order to be uh, comfortable in this space, um, be present. So feel free to participate in any activities in the way that works for you. You know yourself best and you know what you need in order to um, be effective in, to get the most out of the session for yourself. Um, lost our presentation because our cords are a little iffy. All right, there we go. Um, if you are, if you'd like to speak, feel free to use um, the raise hand function to speak or um, uh, just raise your hand if you're in person. Um, please do share your name before speaking so folks know who's talking both online and uh, in person. Feel free to use the chat if you're on Zoom. And then as always, be generous with your knowledge and respectful of other folks' knowledge so that everybody is here to learn from each other and uh, share our own uh, perspectives. We also wanted to have just a brief content warning before we go into this session. Um, so I'll just read this off directly. Um, so during this session, we'll discuss student comments, which may include harmful and microaggressive messages. These can include ideas which are racist, homophobic, transphobic, ableist, and sexist, among others. We will contextualize each instance of this language to illustrate how calling in can help mediate these moments. And we invite you to take breaks as necessary for your well being. So feel free to step away from the computer or move out of the room if that works best for you. 
Um, and I'll just note kind of in a meta way, the goal of these content warnings is not for people to opt out, but so that folks can opt in and so that you can kind of be prepared for what's going to come up in the session um, and make sure that you're able to participate because, you know, reading or seeing a racist comment could be kind of jarring if you're not aware that that's going to happen. Um, so we like to offer these content warnings to make sure that folks know uh, what is coming up in the session. Our little brief agenda for today. Um, so we started with that brief introduction. Shed will talk a little bit about the difference between calling in and calling out. And then we'll talk about some strategies that you can use if you'd like to utilize this calling in um, strategy, both before a, a comment could be made, during a comment being made, and then afterwards. Um, then we'll do a brief calling in case study where you get to kind of practice uh, utilizing calling in and uh, preparing in order to use calling in and then just a brief wrap up. We have outcomes so that you know what you're supposed to be able to get by the end of the workshop. Um, so you'll be able to distinguish calling in from calling out as strategies for approaching classroom comments, selecting some strategies uh, to handle disrupt com disruptive comments before, during, and after class conversations, and then think about the importance of reflecting on your own actions and any missteps that you might make as an instructor. So kind of calling in yourself. And I'll pass it back over to Shed to talk about belonging and responding. All right. So uh, student belonging is tied to better student academic performance, engagement, and motivation to learn. So keeping in mind that belonging is actually central to student success, um, it's hard to do well when you don't feel a sense of belonging, when you don't feel welcome. Right. And minoritized students experience significantly lower levels of belonging, um, which unfortunately is probably not a surprise to any of us across dimensions of socioeconomic status, race, gender, sexual orientation, disability, immigrant status and religion. And I'm sure there's many more that have not been as thoroughly studied as these. Um, and a major factor in belonging is a respectful classroom environment. that better? Okay. Um, so a major factor in belonging is a respectful classroom environment, which interrupts pro problematic statements about positionality. So not just letting the moment pass, right? And little moments add up, microaggressions, right? So the, here's the real sort of like big takeaway here from the research, not addressing and or deflecting problematic statements in class can affirm biased beliefs and legitimize problematic statements. So if a student says something racist, right, and we don't intervene, what message are we tacitly sending? What are we implying to our students? Does anyone want to share? We don't care about me. You don't care? Yeah, go ahead, Doug. Basically, um, so that you're, um, you're setting up a toxic environment that this stuff is acceptable and for those students to use the same words. Absolutely. Yeah, both you're both absolutely right that it unintentionally endorses that perspective. So intervention is important and is necessary. Um, and a little note we always like to include is that it doesn't matter who's present to hear it. So instructors may think, oh, well, you know, I don't I don't have any mixed students in my class. So why would I worry about that? Well, of course, first of all, you don't know if you have any mixed students in your class, right? We don't know what people's identities are by looking at them, nor should we. Um, but also, the students who say it are the ones who need to hear it, right? The students who say the racist or classist or transphobic thing are the ones who need to be reoriented to more thoughtful speech. So those are the students, right? They need to learn that um, just as much as that student needs to be defended, so we wanna distinguish here between calling out and calling in. So you are all probably very familiar with the idea of calling out, which is publicly pointing out that a person is doing something oppressive, putting a spotlight on them, right? You did something wrong, but we know that calling out may not always be the best response. And I would love to hear, why do people think that calling out may not be a great place to start in the classroom? Go ahead, Doug. You don't want to uh, spotlight. Right. Absolutely. Let's say during break or after class, 
call that person aside away from people and let them know um, what they did, what, what they did and how we're gonna correct it in the future. Absolutely. Putting a spotlight on someone is likely to make them defensive, especially in front of all their peers. Go ahead. Related to it, they kept looking defensive, and that's what they were saying. And that's when you shut down. And you Absolutely. Yeah. Um, but, but all of them calling out at the time when they said stop the community, the boss of them and calling them to deliberately othering. Or yeah. So they're not within the status quo. And it was beautiful. Beautifully said, Angela. I love that. Yeah. So, like, it is a space for learning, right? This is an opportunity for learning. And this in calling out is likely to alienate, stigmatize someone. And I don't want to say that calling out is never appropriate. There might be some circumstances where we find it appropriate. We're going to touch on that later. But we want to try and start with calling in, which is a deliberately compassionate practice, pulling folks back in who have strayed from the group. And actually, it sort of starts with the assumption or sort of extending the grace that the person means well. And the person does not always mean well, but we want to give them that chance to show that they can improve, they can grow, or that there is a better way to articulate their thought in a more thoughtful and respectful way. And so I like this quote, um, loving each other enough to allow each other to make mistakes. And so calling in as an idea owes a lot to Black feminist work. So I have noted two authors here who have written really great stuff, um, very accessible online articles about calling in as a practice and why it's important. Um, and so we want to think about calling in as a way of reorienting students towards more positive, more respectful, humanizing behavior and speech. But what does that look like? So let's start with understanding the moments we are calling in. What are these moments we're intervening on? And so we are using this, uh, I guess I can see, um, we are using this model from the Columbia Center for Teaching and Learning, and they call it hot moments. So they distinguish moments in three different categories. There's heated moments where it's clear something has gone wrong, usually characterized by accusations, name calling, yelling. I tend to call this like a glass shattering moment. It's very hard to come back from a moment like that. An offensive moment would be where someone has said something offensive, such as a racist or ignorant joke. And it may or may not be acknowledged and it may or may not become heated. So in a, these moments can morph into one another. An offensive moment can become heated if not resolved properly in the moment. And then there are tense moments where the room goes silent or students are uncomfortable. You've probably had a moment where someone said something and then it got real quiet, right? And that can be a lot harder to identify than offensive or heated. So we have put these icons on the slides. No, we have not. <laughs> the slides that we have, we are going to talk about different strategies for different types of moments. But something we want you to keep in mind is what type of moment are you intervening on and how might that impact your response? So, right, a heated moment may not be a good time for, you know, uh, <laughs> let me think, um, like sharing feelings. You might want to like stop and pause at a heated moment, right? But you might find that a tense moment is a good moment to ask folks to kind of open up and be vulnerable. So how can we tell if a student has made an earnest mistake or is trying to provoke a reaction? This is helpful for us determining how we will respond. So when we're calling in, let's think about these factors when we decide what strategy we're going to use. And we've listed some here and bolded the ones that we think you should really especially consider. So we've got the core sequence, student identity, instructor identity, patterns of behavior. We've got a few more listed here, but we're going to share these slides with you after just as a reminder and that you all have access to them. But just to say, these are important when you're deciding how you do want to respond in the moment is taking into account these factors. And I'm going to pass it back to Mac to get us started on strategies. Cool. This is Mac again. Um, before we move into the strategy section uh, with respect to kind of what Shed shared, does anybody have any questions or comments or uh, musings to share? Uh, yeah, so hell. Yeah, so, um, I was just 
sometimes um, it's not that the student would make an offensive comment necessarily, but it could be interpreted by an other student as offensive. Mm. That could be react in a way. Yeah. That sort of lashes out. I've experienced that before. Yeah. Um, and this is like another, it's not necessarily confined to like one particular comment, but it's yeah. an interpretation of something as well. Absolutely. Yeah. Thanks, Sahil. I was just typing in what you were saying into the chat on Zoom so that folks could uh, <laughs> have access to that same information. Um, but I think that's a really good point is that we don't always know when an offensive or a heated or a tense moment occurs. We may not be able to recognize that just based on our own positionality as instructors. Um, so that's kind of where this idea of being able, being open to having yourself called in by your students can be a really good um, way of creating these like really nice classroom communities and way of ensuring that we're learning more about what uh, other folks are finding in offensive or uh, ignorant, right? Because we're not, we're not all knowing, we're not uh, aware of every single individual's experience. Um, so we have to be willing to make those mistakes and then adjust our behavior in the future. I can throw out there too. I love that point, Max. And also that it should not, come. there's, oh, sorry. Yes. There's no discipline where this is like just limited to like, like it, this could be before class a starts, a student says something and like, but it happened in your classroom, right? So now we have to think about how to deal with it. So just saying like, we don't know when a moment is going to happen, which is why it's important to be prepared regardless of what you're teaching. Great. Any Nothing else on Zoom, um, but feel free to keep putting comments or questions in that chat if you'd like to. Um, so we promised you all some strategies to use before, uh, during, and after. So I'll start with before. Um, so what are some ways that we could potentially approach these types of conversations? One of the best ways to approach any sort of challenging conversation or a conversation that you think could easily move to something contentious um, is to emphasize things like curiosity, exploration, listening, reflection, dialogue, understanding, and respect, rather than agreement or winning. So a lot of times with students, they'll think, I need to say the exact correct answer in order to get points from my professor, or that they may even think that there is a right answer, right? They're trying to get at what is correct, what is right, what they, what they think that you want as the professor. But a lot of times when we're having conversations and discussions in class, there really isn't a right answer, right? Because if we were discussing something, it's harder to discuss things when there's only one right answer. So if we encourage students to really think uh, about curiosity and exploration and listening to one another, that's one of the ways that we can um, get around this, this idea that there has to be a right answer, that there's a particular way that you should be interacting in class. So this comes to this idea of like understanding here would be more important or uh, better to focus on than resolution. There may not always be a resolution. We want to encourage our students to occupy multiple perspectives on the same issue. And this can be a really um, great way to get folks that are maybe a little bit more hesitant to engage in class to engage. Because if you're taking someone else's perspective, it doesn't really reflect back on you. Instead, it's somebody else's perspective, and you can maybe a little bit more easily dive into that perspective, challenge it, critique it, um, accept it when you're not uh, you know, directly reflecting that uh, opinion back on yourself. Um, and then finally, thinking about how collegial dialogue is a disciplinary skill and scholarly practice for every discipline, right? There's no discipline that... Uh, where we don't have dialogue with one another. So when we emphasize this as a disciplinary skill and scholarly practice, we help our students understand and learn why this is so important for them to be able to do, why it's so important to be able to approach these conversations in a way that is open um, and accepting. So what, how are, what are some of the ways that we can actually do this? Um, so we have some ideas for what you can do, kind of do before you get to a point where you want to have a discussion in class. So this could be good, good things to do on your first day of class or early on in the semester. Um, some of these strategies were definitely shared earlier in various workshops throughout the day. So if you've been to any of these, apologies for sharing them again, um, but it's always good to reinforce. Um, so some ideas here are to develop goals and a plan for the discussion. So think about what are your goals for this discussion? And you could even consider using something like a structured discussion technique 
where instead of just posing a question to your students, you have an actual structure to how that discussion could go. Um, and we have some resources that we'll share afterwards about different options that you have for what those structured discussions could look like. Um, you can co-create or remind students of those classroom norms or guidelines and definitely share with students or have them co-create what good participation looks like so everybody knows how to interact. Um, you can include a, a syllabus statement on respectful dialogue, and we have a couple examples in the slides. We won't go over them, um, but they are there as reference. We also have some handouts that I think we forgot to put on the table. Um, so folks can review those in the event that you'd like to look over what those respectful dialogue statements are. Um, we want to make sure to uh, make our boundaries clear and consider and talk about what happens when our students leave the boundaries of appropriate behavior. We need to have that kind of plan in place so that we know what we'll do if something happens. Um, and so that's how we, we plan for these various challenging comments that might occur. So for example, I, uh, I'm i a biologist I and I work with viruses. Um, so I recently had a conversation with my students about vaccine mandates with respect to the COVID-19 pandemic. And I knew that was gonna be kind of a contentious conversation, right? Like some people may, some people are still the opinion that vaccines cause autism. We may have some folks that think vaccines don't work. Um, and then also I had to consider the fact that there's still a lot of trauma going around when it comes to thinking about the pandemic, especially in an academic context with students that haven't had the experience of talking about science in this way. So when I thought about all of these things, I was like, okay, what are all the things that these students could say? How might I respond? How might I address those? How do we turn these instances into a learning moment for the rest of the class? And by thinking about all of that, and it doesn't take a very long time as an instructor, you, you probably have a sense of what these, uh, what things students might say, but it helped me feel more prepared. And then I knew what would happen in the event that a student did say something that I needed to intervene on. So that was our strategies for before. Now we'll go through some sentence stems that you can use for when a challenging comment is actually made um, and what some of those options that you have are. So our first one is the pause. Um, and I like this one because it basically lets you know that you don't have to respond immediately, right? Something happens and a lot of times people think, okay, I need to respond immediately, have a really eloquent thought out. Uh, with citation. With, right, yeah. and that's not always the case, right? Because you may have been affected by that comment. Comments aren't, uh, students aren't the only ones who get affected by various challenging comments that other students might say. Um, so you do have the option of pausing. And what can that look like? So it can be anything from very short to slightly longer. So you could take a few breaths or a sip of water. You could give the entire class a five to 10 minute break to let you gather your thoughts, let students gather your thought, their thoughts, and then you come back together and discuss what happened. Um, or even potentially if something particularly egregious happens or you just really have no idea how to address it, um, you can return to the next class session with more information or more preparation and potentially reach out to us at CTRL if you do need help trying to figure out how to respond to, if uh, something does happen. And then I'll pass it over to Shed to go over other uh, during strategies. Thank you. So this is Shed. Um, so let's talk about some other during strategies, starting with clarification and redirection. So often a student might say one of these comments, um, but when you say it back to them or ask them to clarify, they realize how it sounded, perhaps. So um, you could ask, how do you see that connecting to the topic that we're talking about? Or keeping our respectful practices or classroom guidelines in mind, can you tell me more about that? Or you can just outright ask the speaker to reflect what do you think this group would say about that? Or I understand, but what, yeah, I think this group might be hurt by that. And then you can help with rewording. So sometimes I hear students say something and I think they have a good idea they're trying to express, but they don't have the language for it. So maybe I say, I think I might know what you're saying. Correct me if I'm wrong. And then I offer them a more respectful phrasing and they go, oh, yes, that that's what but I don't have the words for it. But I've just given them the, those words or even saying I want to encourage you to use other language. 
Another thing to keep in mind is trying to focus on the group and group accountability. So if a student, um, you know, makes a mistake, they say something hurtful, whatever it might be, one option is to make it about community learning and say, can we, can we try to be more careful? So it's not just the one student, right? It's something, maybe one student said it, but maybe more worth thinking it. So this is a good strategy for that. Refer to your community agreements, saying something like, speaking like this breaks our discussion agreement. So this would be in a more intense situation or example, but to keep in mind, we want to avoid the interaction becoming student versus teacher or students, a, a little like group of students versus teacher, because it's totally gonna undermine your authority and become just a back and forth, right? So can we make it about the student's accountability, not just to you as the instructor, but to the entire class? So these things that you are saying, right, they are, it's not just that I don't like them as the instructor and they make me uncomfortable, but they're not responsible to the humanity of your peers. You have to be accountable to your peers, right? So remind students of who is present or more precisely, we don't know who's present. We gotta speak like that group is here in the room. You know, um, again, people will say things about race and I'm like, I'm mixed race, I'm here, <laughs> you know, don't forget about me. So we don't know what people are bringing with them to class. So let's speak as though they're in the room, whoever that population is, because they probably are. And if appropriate, turn the issue over to the class. So asking students to help you call another student in if it seems appropriate. So a student might share an opinion and then I might say, I hear what you're saying, what do others think? And usually another student comes in with the assist to use sports language. And then I will say, be like, great, they just learned from a peer. And I didn't, I wasn't the one to tell them they were gonna learn better from a peer than from me. Okay, so a slightly escalate, yes, please go ahead. Just a general first question, I don't know if you are not doing this on purpose. But yeah. Can you give me some specific examples from your instructing yeah. or from what you heard about just so that folks Absolutely. in the room and online can get a sense of like, oh, here is where you might challenge that kind of wording or language. Here. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to give an example, and um, thankfully I haven't heard it in many years, but when I taught in the Midwest, it came up a lot. I say people of color, and my students would sometimes say colored people back to me, not realizing that that is a very heavily weighted, hurtful term, right? But they would do a sort of communicative thing where they would go, well, if you can say people of color, I could probably just swap those words, right? And they didn't mean harm, but me hearing it, I see it. I immediately kind of tense up. So I expect started to expect it every semester. It reliably happened when I taught in Indiana. And um, when it happened, I would immediately sort of say, hey, just to let you know, you know, I just I want to let everyone know. Um, I understand why you might say colored people, but I want to us to acknowledge that that is a term with a very uh, like a storied history. I would might say a little bit about why it's hurtful. So I'm going to ask that we use people of color or BIPOC um, or something like that. Is that, does that kind of answer that question? Yeah, absolutely. Mac, do any come to mind or do you wanna? Um, I think they've actually wanted to... On this slide? Yes. yes. Um, and we, uh, sorry, let me get over to yes. the mic. Uh, we also have another example, like we have a case study at the end that has a specific comment that a student yeah. uh, could potentially make. And I'll note, I again, I teach biology type courses, so some of the identity-based uh, comments don't always happen, but I get comments that are more, I would say more ignorant. So students may say things like, well, vaccines do cause autism. And then I, as the instructor, have to step in and try to uh, have a conversation with them about the fact that vaccines don't cause autism and how we have the information that, uh, that, 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 yeah, that that doesn't occur. Um, so you could have kind of, I think that gets us into two different situations that you could have. So you could have identity-based things and then content-based things that you might need to intervene with. Okay. So um, let's say we're communicating hurt and insult. This can be very important if perhaps someone is not responding to any of the other strategies you shared with them, or you think it's really important to foreground communicating to them that they did calm, cause harm with their words. It was hurtful when you said that we should not prioritize access for disabled people on AU's campus. Everyone has a right to get into the buildings on campus. 
give it a second. <laughs> and we should not gatekeep access, knowledge, and connections for disabled people simply because some cannot walk or get inside a building. So this is a, a, like a, a, a rather eloquent response. So we may not come up with that in the moment, but that could be something that you communicate next class after preparing it. Um, I swear I'm not doing anything. Um, <laughs> uh, and then, so that would be a positive way to communicate that. Though what we might want to say is like, you're so you're saying you hate disabled people and you don't want us on our AU's campus. So that might be what I think inside. But what I say to the student would be explaining why it was hurtful and how it can be improved. <laughs> I, I'm not going to touch anything. Okay. So when you speak back to moments like this, of course, using like I statements, just like they say in therapy, right? But explaining it was hurtful when you said this because this and to explain why it is dehumanizing, hurtful, inconsiderate. And we want to, again, reinforce intervening immediately in the event of explicitly harmful language, right? A slur, a microaggression, um, racist, sexist, homophobic, et cetera, remarks. It's really important, even if you don't know exactly what to say. I don't think any of us really do off the top of our heads, but it's very important to like not just let it pass by, right? Even if you just say, wait, I want to address that that is showing students that you noticed it and that you are not permitting it, right? So this is a rather escalated sort of place to go. If all else fails, ask someone to leave class. Um, I, that's something I know instructors worry about having to do, um, but I wanna let you know that I, I don't see it happening very often. I have had to do it, but I also teach about gender and uh, and equality. And so I think it's it's sort of part of, uh, that environment, but um, I don't want people to feel really scared that you might have to ask someone to leave class like every semester. Um, it's rather rare for someone to have to do it, but it's good for us to keep in mind if we do have to do that, how might we do that, right? And to use some of these strategies, refer back to the community and that they have done harm to that community, that they have not followed the guidelines that you set, right? That their actions are hurtful. So then, after a conversation, whether it has been a planned conversation or something came up out of nowhere, we want to address it afterwards through reflection. So you as the instructor should reach out to affected students over email, office hours, before, after class, and see how they are doing, check on them, what do they need? Um, and also, of course, the students who may have, who said the thing, you want to check in with them too, and maybe understand what happened and how can we prevent it from happening again. You may want to start the next class with a reflective pause. So you may ask your students, and I've done this before, after the student, I asked the student to leave the next class, I asked, how can we avoid this? And we worked together to figure out some new norms. So what could have been different? How will the class proceed in this discussion and future discussions? Could different preparation have changed how the conversation went? And that's, again, an opportunity for you as the instructor to take accountability and maybe say, maybe I could have done this more. Let's try that. Thank you for, you know, thank you for experimenting with me. Consider reviewing or adapting your class contract or guidelines or norms because maybe they were not quite doing their job as well as they could have been. And then accept responsibility if needed. So did you say or do something that contributed to the discomfort? Maybe you took a while to acknowledge it, right? Or maybe you had said something that exacerbated it. Um, it's okay to acknowledge you should have responded. So maybe a student misgenders another student and you don't immediately respond, but there's still a chance to respond. You can still say something the next class or another class session after that. You could remind students to respect each other's pronouns and that it's important to humanize people in that way. Um, it's okay, even if it's not immediately after, there is always still time, right? Um, and sooner is just gonna be better. And uh, you can invite anonymous comments or suggestions from students like creating a Google form where they could contribute how they're feeling or what suggestions they have. This is very important, <laughs> I wanna emphasize we always like to emphasize disagreement is not wrong. Disagreement is central to the discussions we're going to have and our learning and our growth. Making hurtful comments is, 
Disrespect is the issue here, not disagreement. So we wanna emphasize that to our students as well. I expect you to disagree sometimes. I expect you not to all have the same opinion, of course, but you must do so respectfully. It is a lack of respect that earns someone, you know, that gets someone in trouble. It is not that they have a different opinion from you or anyone else in class. Maybe I'm just cursed, Mac. Okay. So we wanna give you some suggestions before we go into our case study about being prepared to call in. And of course we recommend a proactive rather than reactive approach. The earlier, the better. The earlier you have your students put, you know, put together norms, the easier it's gonna to be to practice them. And the earlier you, you know, talk about these things or the earlier you address it, the better. So instead of waiting and hoping it won't happen, let's be ready because it's likely to happen. There's going to be conflict, there's gonna be discomfort. So practice one or two go-to responses from the sentence stems. It can feel very uncomfortable to use that language, but that's because we haven't practiced it. And the more we practice it, the more comfortable it gets. Document, very important. If you have one of these moments, send an email after. Thank you for meeting me during office hours. We talked about how to um, you know, pr contribute productively to class. Or, you know, maybe let someone in your department know, like CCing a chair or someone like that, that you have had these conversations. So that way you have a history of talking to students and working this out with them. And remember, you do not have to be an expert. Something we often hear is people saying, well, I'm not, uh, let's see, I'm not trans. How could I intervene on transphobia? I'm not black. How could I intervene on anti-black racism? Well. It's good to not right, overstep into another experience, but you can still intervene using these two strategies. The first is honoring lived experience. So you can say, you know what? I, do, I, am not, uh, I am not a black person. I don't know what it's like to be black, but I think if I was, I would be pretty upset. I would be pretty hurt. That would be actually utilizing empathy, saying that would be very dehumanizing or hurtful to me. Or honoring lived experience by saying, if we listen, to what this community tells us, we have been told, right, that this is hurtful or this action is dehumanizing. So to honor, right, what uh, marginalized communities tell us they want and need. So we are going to uh, take a little while, maybe not exactly 10 minutes because we are being uh, cognizant of time, but a little bit of time in groups to look at this case study. So uh, people online will be in a breakout room or two. And in person, um, we are also going to have the case study on the next slide. So um, please read through it, consider the questions, and then we will do a quick debrief among all of us. Uh, and it should be in the handout, right, Mac? The case study is in there. So you might cluster with some people who are close to you into a small group and answer the or brainstorm around the questions that are listed at the bottom. Switch over here. All right, folks, we're getting to the end of our session. So just kind of finish up your convos real quick. All right, folks, let's get back together. Um, I know we only have like about a minute left. So we wanted to offer, uh, in the event that anybody had, uh, we were gonna ask for key takeaways, but I think if there was something that wasn't resolved or like you had a question that you couldn't figure out the answer to, or you're like, I don't even know how to respond to this. Um, we'd love to hear kind of what came up in your discussion, uh, maybe from one or two people, if we uh, don't get kicked out by the dessert social. <laughs>
Is there anything unresolved or a takeaway if there wasn't anything res unresolved? All right, I'm going to ask folks to focus up here. People online is here. So we kind of were debating um, a little bit, not debating, discussing, dialoguing around was calling in students during class versus calling them in after class. Mm -hmm. And a chat, like, so we're saying with Kingston, for example, do we call them in in that moment, or do we say, you know, let's talk after class and then call them in to have a conversation then? Um, and the pros and cons of that, I was saying, like, the downside is the rest of the class doesn't know that this was addressed, but the benefit is Kingston will likely be much more receptive and feel less put on the spot, like Doug was saying before, is can be problematic. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's a, it's a hard line to decide on, right? It might depend on your um, your relationship with that student, because if you know them really well, it might be easier to actually have the conversation in class, but it might also be easier to have it outside of class. But um, I would say at least it is important to note to folks that like this is not an okay thing to say, even if you're not necessarily going to have a conversation with the students in class at that time and try to talk through this comment with Kingston. Um, I do think it would be important for folks to know that like this this does go against our community guidelines. This does go against how we'd want um, you know, people to talk about us. Like I wouldn't want someone to call me delusional for my political choices in the same way that uh, you know, someone else in the class might also feel similarly. So I think there's a there might be like a medium uh, option here where you can say like this isn't an okay thing to say have a conversation with Kingston outside of class and then maybe even come back to it the next class and be like, how do we um, avoid this kind of interaction in the future? How do we make sure that this doesn't happen as we move um, into the rest of our class together? All right, any other comments that folks would like to share or questions or considerations? Anything on Zoom, Shed? All right, All right folks. Well, that puts us at the end. We're a little bit over, so we're just going to skip the um, our uh, little debrief. Um, and we'll skip this poll. You don't need to answer the poll, but um, a question for you to take with you as you go throughout the rest of your day or even the rest of the week. Um, think about one or two calling in strategies that you'd like to practice and add to your teaching toolkit. So what are some of these that really resonated with you? And what do you want to make sure that you can bring into the classroom this semester? And with that, um, thank you all for joining us. Uh, Shed and my's emails are down there on the slide, shed at american.edu or mkrite at american.edu. And we'll follow up with all of our resources afterwards um, over email. Thanks.